there, everyone. My name is Sarah Faxon. I am an author, creative warrior, vlogger, and podcaster. And here tonight on S. Faxon Productions, we are continuing our author series with my dear friend, Tamara Merrill. Now, Tamara Merrill is the author of Shadows in Our Bones, the Augustus Family Trilogy, also a contributor to Magic, Mystery, and Murders, an anthology where she was also one of the editors involved in that project as well. Uh, Tamara, I want to thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Thank you for having me, Sarah. I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> now, Tamara and I met a couple, almost a, over a year ago, I believe. I think about a year ago, yeah. So. I think initially at one of the San Diego Writers and Editors Guild meetings, following the San Diego Union Tribune um, Authors Festival that happened. Am I correct on that? I think that might be right. At the... Um... Uh, whatever they, the marketing meeting that they hold there. <laughs> and because of that too, I became very interested in your course, which we'll talk about at the end of this video. So definitely stay tuned, dear viewers, uh, to hear about Writer's Crutch, a wonderful marketing class put together by Tamara Merrill and Jerry Stravey. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, right now, we're going to start off with talking to Tamara about her incredible book, Shadows in Our Bones. Now, I picked up Shadows in Our Bones just a couple of days ago, and I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll start thumbing through this to see, um, just get a feel for it for this interview, and holy cow, I can barely put it down. <laughs> it Thank is you. so <laughs> captivating. I was just texting one of my friends before I did this interview. I was like, you have to read this book. It's so interesting. And I, you know, I've heard you talk about it several times and always thought about it, but now that I'm in it, it is so true to some of the things that I've uh, learned and have researched coming from a humanitarian a government and politics background. And so this has been such an incredible read for me. Would you like to tell our viewers a bit more about your book, Tamara? Sure, yeah. I'd love to. It is historical fiction, um, which means when you write historical fiction, you research like crazy so that you get all of the facts and you know everything about the event, not everything, obviously, but you know a great deal about the event that you're going to write about. And then you populate that book with characters that are relatable and that you feel can tell the story. So I started, and my other three books are historical fiction also. So I started this book thinking it was going to be the same way. And as I got into the research, it turned out to be quite different. So I'm going to back up just a second and say that I didn't know the story of Malaga Island. I had never, I, I'm not from Maine. I have no other than friends living in Maine. I'm not from the East Coast. I knew nothing about it. And um, I have to talk about back. it like a native. <laughs> <It's so good. laughs> well, I was back in Maine visiting my friends and um, we were doing the Common Grounds Fair. And some of your listeners may know about that if they're old hippies. The Common Grounds Fair feels like you've stepped back to 1975. It's super fun. Um, very much the hippie movement still in effect in Maine. And so, but it was very cold. It was extremely cold. And I'm a girl from Southern California. So the second day, I let my friend Bobby go by herself. She was demonstrating rug, rug braiding, which tells you something about what the event is like. <laughs> but, um, but I let her go by herself. And her husband took me on just a little road trip around Maine. And um, when you're driving down the, I can't remember the number of the highway now, but when you're driving on the highway that goes along the coast, everything is familiar to a, somebody from the West Coast. They're all names we've heard about. We see them in the history books, all of these kinds of things. So I was kind, kind of excited and I was asking all kinds of questions about history. And he said, oh, let me tell you this story about Malaga Island. It's over there. And he, you know, and you couldn't see it. It was all clouded in. And he said, it's over there off the coast. And he told me this story. And the minute I heard the story, I knew that I wanted to write a book about it. I mean, literally, the minute I heard the story, I was like, okay, this is really, really interesting. Okay, but I was still working on the other book I was working on. It was published, etc. And then I was back in Maine for Thanksgiving. And they had one of the councilmen at dinner for Thanksgiving. And Denny said to me, we need a book about Malaga Island. And my wife says, you're the best writer she knows. So we want you to write it. 
And I went, oh, thank you very much. You know, because that was pretty exciting just even to be told that. It happened yeah. she's a member of Bobby's book club and they had they had read my other three books in their book club. And so they, they hired me to write this story of Maine. And their only um, caveat was it needed to be accessible so they could use it in the adult education system because they want people to know the story, but people don't like to read history books. Okay. And so it was a good, that part was a good challenge. So I started researching and then I started interviewing people. And when you read the book, absolutely every character in the book is a real person. Um, the only people whose names have been changed is the O'Brien family in Seattle. They are real people. That's their real story. They do not live in Seattle, and that is not their name because they asked not to be named. Mm -hmm. Everyone else was willing to be interviewed and named. Um, many people declined to be interviewed because it is still a stigma to be associated with Malaga Island and have your family be considered Malagaites. So that alone was a fascinating thing. And between the Historical Society and all of their artifacts, and the big exhibit that they put on, I had lots of research material. I, and I loved every minute of the research. That it's For readers, you know, those of us that love to read, what's better than reading a whole bunch of other people's diaries and digging into things and finding out stuff and looking at old pictures? And so um, the book does include at the back of the book, um, if you have a Kindle version, it does not include it. If you have a printed version at the back of the book, um, there's a lot of actual newspaper articles and pictures that are things that were used for the research in the book. So oh. basically, it is the story of Malaga Island, where in 1902, the state of Maine decided that perhaps this island would be put to better use if they got rid of the degenerates that lived on the island. And by degenerates, they meant a group of mixed race people who had, were living just peacefully, just fine, acting just like any other fishermen, but they were mixed race. And some of them were living together in sin. And so at that time, that was, I know, exactly. <laughs> at that time, that was reason enough to start name calling. And that's exactly what it happened. The, the media of the day, bought right into all of it. And it, at the same time, the eugenics movement in the United States was just getting a strong foothold. So those things together compounded the hatred that was exhibited against the islanders and the desire to get them pushed off the island and move away. Um, and I'm not, I'm not ruining the story by saying this because it starts in the very first chapter, you know something is happening. Yeah. But but then it goes on and it covers the a hundred years the next hundred years as um, these people hide they don't want to be known um, some of them um, stay in the area but most of them left the area and then finally through DNA testing a family in Seattle finds out that they're related to this a family who had always thought they were pure one hundred percent red headed white skinned um, Irish people, and they find out that they have that they are related to the descendants of Malaga, and that they have black blood, and so then begins the search as they as the two stories come together. So basically, it is also a story of racism, coming to grips with racism, family love, learning to accept who you are, learning to accept other people. Um, learning to treat each other with kindness. I say that and then I think, oh, that makes it sound kind of preachy. I don't think it's a <laughs> preachy book. I hope it's not a preachy book because that was never the intention. But, but it is a fascinating story if I do say so myself. And I'm delighted that people are enjoying it. And I'm also delighted that so many people are lobbying to have a movie made out of it, which makes it very exciting. So I, I, I would I, agree I with that. that. Thank um, you. Um, it, it has calls to like Handmaid's Tale. Uh, yeah. In the sense of it puts a lot of real things that have happened in our face. And uh, Margaret Atwood, in some of her interviews, says that, you know, nothing that she has written about didn't happen 
in real life and history. And that's one of the things I'm appreciating so much about your book is that it is putting so many things that I've experienced right back in my face and like, oh my gosh, yeah. You know, there's so many things I relate to from Cora reading The Awakening, which is one of my favorite <laughs> books of all time, <laughs> it's so good. Um, to hearing these families that are like, everything is great. You can totally be friends with these people. Just don't marry them. <laughs> and, yeah. um, you know, having these same conversations 100 years ago in modern day, you know, it's really making me think, how far have we really come? And I, yeah. it's incredible. That is one of the things that I really in, enjoyed, wrong word, but because a lot of writing this book was very painful, but I really exploring that we really haven't come that far. I mean, I said earlier, I'm an old hippie. You know, I went through all of the the marches and all of those things. And, and sometimes I really worry about how far we've come. And it's been very interesting as I am out in the public talking about this book, how many people come up to me and they say things like, well, I'm not prejudiced, but I don't yeah. want my, you know. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, or they this, or, you mm -hmm. know, and it's like, well, that's prejudice and that's racism. And, and um, it, it's hard for people to admit how much of it still goes on until they or start even talking to about recognize it, it too. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't, thing too. they don't want to recognize it, but yeah. when they start talking about it, they have to recognize it because they're in a group where there's other people. And then it's like, Oh my God, did I just say that? That's, that's terrible. That wasn't what I meant. So mm -hmm. yeah, it is. It, I do think we made improvement. Don't, I don't, you know, I do think it is better, but I don't think, I do think we're still, there's a, still a lot of racism going on. And it and difficult racism, um, painful situations. The family, um, Mitch's family, not wanting him to marry out of his ethnicity, um, is a very real thing that happens all of the time, even today. You know, oh, yeah. sure, people marry out, but it's still the family is saying no, no, no. You know. Oh yeah, I, I mean, right off the bat, I can think of half a dozen examples. And people in my generation that I know of where this is still the case. Yep. And, um, you know, we like to think of ourselves as millennials as, you know, this open, loving, um, great generation. And while we may indeed think of ourselves like that, you know, we're still want to respect our families and our um, family's wishes. And so it comes up in your book of how far do I go to pursue love or to respect my family mm -hmm. and my family's desires and um, wishes for me? And it, it's really, really um, fascinating. And if you guys haven't picked it up yet, I highly recommend picking up Shadows in Our Bones. Wonderful, wonderful read. Um, great quarantine read, guys. So definitely pick this one up. <laughs> While we're all doing our deep introspection right now, this is a great, it's, it's a great novel to pick up. While it's introspective, it's also enjoyable. You yeah. know, it's, it will Absolutely. make you cry a couple of times. It'll make you laugh a couple of times, you know, but it, but it is, um, um, it will also make you think, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So on top of things that make us think or continuing on with things that make us think, um, as you were starting to develop Shadows in Our Bones and your Augustus Family um, uh, trilogy, were you starting to realize, or at what point were you starting to realize, I have to do a lot of marketing for this. I have to do a lot to get my books out. When did that start to evolve? How did that start to evolve? And um, what has resulted as a part of your journey of marketing? <laughs> well, let me, I'll make it very brief. The first book um, that I put out was called Family Lies, and it was self-published, just totally self-published, nothing, you know, I stuck it up on Kindle, you know, Amazon reads. I did have enough sense to also put it out to Nook and all of the other readers, but I, I just self-published it. I didn't know anything else. And um, this was 20, I'm going to say 14. It might have been 2013, something, I don't know, somewhere in there, though. But I just put it out there, and it was good. And Amazon picked it up as one of their books. And um, but they used to have this thing called Amazon Publishing that is no longer there. But they picked it up. And so when I wrote the second book, it, can, it came out under the Amazon Publishing. And um, 
then I got a contact. And so all of this is just happening. And I'm not getting huge numbers of sales. I guess in the Amazon world, I was doing well. But remember, this was early in when e-readers were just really, really, really taking off, you know. And so I was doing well. But then I got a contact and it went nowhere. They, um, it was to publish the third book of the trilogy and they wanted the rights to all three books and et cetera, et cetera. And um, at one point when I said, well, are you going to publish family myths or not? The, the girl that, who was my editor said to me, well, you know, you're a woman of a certain age and we're not really sure whether you'll write another book. And wow. so we don't have any, I know, painful, right? Speaking yeah. of ageism is just as bad as racism, by the way. Mm -hmm. But so... Um, so I thought to myself, well, then I don't want someone to take my book that isn't going to promote it, you know, and I got my contract back. commit to you as an author, too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and at that point, I realized that I had to promote it, that I, that, um, I'm fortunate in that I've already retired from my real life, and so it wasn't like I was trying to make my living writing at this point, although at one point in the past, I did make my living writing for magazines, but I wasn't, um, I wasn't concerned about it at this point. And, but I knew that if I'm going to write these books, I actually want a little bit bigger readership. And in order to do that, I need to promote this. And so um, in right about that same time, the anthology came out and so I played around a little bit with what it meant to promote a book for the anthology. Not a lot, just a little bit. Just thinking, okay, wait a minute, a book launch, should I get it in the newspaper? What should I do with it? And so then I was writing Shadows in Our Bones. And I literally took a calendar and 18 months out, I gave myself a published a publish date that hadn't been confirmed by the publisher yet, but it was what I gave myself as a goal. And I backtracked through every single solitary task that I would need to do in order to really promote this book. Was I going to use social media? Was I going to blog? Was I going to put out interviews in the newspaper? Was I going to do press releases? Was I going to look for radio interviews, et cetera, et cetera? Marketing is a lot of work. It's fun, mm -hmm. but it's not writing, you know, so, and it takes away from your writing. You cannot do marketing in 15 minutes a day. Yeah. I love it when I get those ads in my email, you know, it's like, we'll teach you to do all your marketing in 15 minutes a day. Well, you're not going to do a very good job on it. I'll tell you that. So, yeah. so um, then I was, and so, and this book was successful. Immediately, this book was successful. I sold 13,000 copies, 1,300 copies, 13,000 would have been really nice. I sold 1,300 <laughs> copies in pre-sale. And wow. that's a lot for a yeah. book that's not <clears throat> coming. It's coming out from a university of press and et cetera. And then immediately it took off from there and it has done extremely well. It's in a lot of libraries. It's all over the nation. It's all over the world now. And I put it down to the fact that for 18 months, I promoted this book, even as I was writing it. The book was finished complete and out for reviews with the big reviewers a year before it was actually published because that's what it takes if you want big reviews you need to you'll have to have it done ahead of time a lot of self and that's true for all self publishers but now it's true for any small press you're with also the only people that get promotion from a big press are the Stephen Kings and the J.K. Rawlings. They don't have to do their own marketing. But and it's Margaret Atwood, who is one of my absolute favorites, I'm sure she doesn't have to do her own marketing either. But, you know, at any of point. the... <laughs> at this point, yes, at this yeah. point. So um, so then we were in the San Diego Writers Guild meeting, and, we, and that was one of the things I mentioned in that meeting. And Jerry was in that meeting, and he said wow, 18 month calendar, that's a good idea. Um, let's write, let's write a class about it. And I said, oh dear, I don't really want to, you know, and then it's <laughs> and turned out the idea was bored. <laughs> <laughs> it's turned out to be so much fun. It is a constant updating of the class material, because this is an eight week intensive class about not just how to create your calendar so that you stay on track, 
but all of those tasks that you have to do. We don't teach people how to self-publish. We don't teach people how to write a blog. We teach people these are ways to promote your book. You need to choose. Now you need to stick to it. And this is how often you need to do it and what you need to do. And um, I know you were in the first class that took it. And you know it's intensive. There is a lot of information. <laughs> um, the second class is just finishing up now. So they're in the area of blah, 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 what shall we do here? You know, but it is but it is um, fun to show people that they can do this. It, it is what will take your writing from being a book that your mom and your friends read. And if you're lucky, you'll get a few book clubs. Maybe the um, press will pick it up and then you'll get some sales. But you know, most self-published authors only sell 100 copies. Mm -hmm. And um, that's not anybody's dream. I mean, it feels really good. But what they are, everyone dreams about is selling more. And the way you can sell more is people have to know about your book. And it's not a matter of just putting the cover on Facebook and saying over and over again, buy my book, because that isn't what how you promote yourself or your book. But you come and take our class and we'll teach you all about it. And you were right. It is writerscrutch.com. And there's another class starting in June. So there will perpetually going on and on classes. So not every week, not every day, you know. But, so. I highly recommend Writer's Crutch if you're not in the San Diego area or you're not quite comfortable joining one yet or a marketing class, start looking into it. If you're trying to write a book or if you have the intention of publishing a book to be sold, tomorrow's so right. You have to do majority of the marketing because having those big traditional publishers out there to be your marketing team isn't really an option for most of us authors. And so you have to start building your um, base, you have to start building your readers, you have to start reaching out to people beyond your immediate circle. And so getting on interviews like this or being active on social media, you don't have to do all the social medias, just pick and choose the ones that work for you. Um, but yeah, having a strong base and an understanding of what's going on is so important and prior to taking writer's crutch i was trying to do it all <laughs> and was sort of losing my mind and pulling out my hair in the process so having the guidance of jerry and tamara was absolutely huge and has really helped to organize me with that now famous 18 month calendar and, <laughs> which i absolutely love and so you know finding that if nothing else just a support group to help you through the marketing woes is huge and again, highly, highly, highly recommend Writer's Crutch. Um, so Tamara, do you have any other closing words you'd like to recommend or any final writing tips for our viewers out there? Well, really the other thing I would say is besides finding your group that will support you in your marketing, the other most important thing is your writer's group. The group of people that you meet with who support you in your writing, who keep you on track. So I always recommend to everyone find a writer's group and they are seldom the same thing because the people in the writer's group are usually at different stages of their book and you are looking at people who are for your marketing group you want people who seriously want to market their writing and it is much more than just marketing your book it is marketing yourself your writing who you are so get your group and enjoy it would be what I say I would I just give talk, toot my own horn a little bit and say I am currently writing a new book, uh, which is on my 18 month calendar and moving along nicely. It is called Just One More, and it is going to be a psychological thriller. And um, just as a little hint, I will throw out there that it starts with a 10 year old girl who murders someone. Well, Come. I'm adding that to my list. <laughs> <laughs> so it could, it could be more different than shadows in our bones, but I'm having a good time writing it. So, And that's the key, isn't it? Just making sure what you're writing is something you enjoy and the rest just kind of follows. All righty. Well, thank you again, Tamara. This has been absolutely lovely. Uh, it's been such a joy having you here. Um, for you viewers out there, be sure to check out her website. I'll include the link in the description below. 
And we will see you next time. Be sure to like, subscribe, and click that notification bell to stay in the latest SFAX and production videos and to see who we'll be interviewing next. Thank you again, Tamara, so much. It's been a Thanks, total Sarah. delight. Good night. <laughs>